Um, so this is the second um, of three sessions on climate change and gardening. And today we're gonna focus a little bit more on um, kind of direct impacts um, and, uh, you know, uh, pests, diseases, soil, things we can do and things we um, need to do to kind of prepare ourselves for cha changing conditions for growing food. Um, Hannah Harrington is with us tonight. She is the president of our board and she's going to be our moderator for tonight's discussion. So she will introduce um, Anne and um, Kat and then um, try to keep everybody a little bit on a, on a schedule. Um, we do have a, a little bit extra time without Charlie being here, but um, I will I will monitor the chat. So if you have questions during the talk that either Ann or Kat are gonna be um, doing, go ahead and push the, put those into the chat and we'll try to get to them as they come up. Um, we'll certainly have some time at the end for some questions and answers too. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah. She's been on our board for four years now. Um, works for with Feeding Chittenden and um, is a very uh, food advocate, food supporter, food advocate. Um, um, and we've worked very nicely together. And it's been instrumental in getting this program, this, um, this uh, program. To Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Hannah. And like Michelle, Michelle said, I chair the board. Um, a little bit about Vermont Garden Network. For those of you who don't know, there's just so much that this organization does from teaching people how to start and grow gardens at home, in schools, in the community, training garden leaders um, to educate and manage the spaces, uh, really connecting the community around gardening. Um, there's more than 500 community-based gardens in Vermont, so a really huge community in the state um, of community gardens. And also providing garden nutrition and nutrition education, advocacy, and funding to support these initiatives. I would love, I'm so excited to welcome you all to part two of this series, Floods, Frost, and Fungus. How do we mitigate and adjust for the direct consequences of climate change? How do we manage extreme weather fluctuations? What are the impacts of and strategies for improving soil health? What can we expect in terms of pests and diseases? And how do we protect our plants? I would like to introduce our speakers today. We have Kat Buxton from Regenerative Regeneration Corps and Vermont Health Soils Coalition. She'll be talking about what are the impacts of and strategies for improving soil health? What can we do to protect our plants and the earth from floods and drought? We also have Anne Hazelrig, director from Plant Diagnostics Clinic at UVM Extension. We'll be talking about the impact now and in the future of climate change on pests and beneficial insects and diseases affecting our plants, strategies for mitigating impacts and adaptations we can make for better results. I think after, like Michelle said, you can put questions in the chat, so we'll keep keep an eye on that. And we have some, some questions that have been submitted ahead of time. So excited to get to those. And Kat, if you'd like to take it away, or Anne, I guess either of you can start, but <laughs> I have Kat on my, on my list to kick it off. I'd like to invite Anne to go first, if you don't mind, because okay. Anne has slides. Sure. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, no problem. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, where is it? Should be at the bottom if you. Yeah, I was just trying to see where, where my screen was. So I'm doing. Okay, is that, can you see my picture? Yep. Okay, good, all right. So uh, climate change and gardening, and yeah, I'm gonna talk mainly about pests and diseases. 
Uh, I don't have a lot about beneficials. I didn't know I was covering that. But um, basically, you know, none, none of us have a crystal ball. But um, one thing we know is that climate change, uh, let me try to, I can't see my, oh, okay. Um, with climate change, we're going to get more extremes. We're going to get higher temperatures, more rain events, and more drought. And these two um, uh, pictures on my screen, the map on the left shows the percent increases in um, amount of precipitation falling in very heavy events. Um, and if you look at New England, we have increased, we've had a change of 71% on the increase of our heavy precipitation events. We're getting a lot of rain all at once or a lot of snow all at once and then, um, and then having times that have nothing. We've got drought. Also the picture on the right is the top 10 states with the biggest increases in heavy downpours and there's Vermont number seven on the list. So that's a definite uh, impact of now, huh, I don't know why I'm, I can't advance it. Maybe I should end show and reshare. I don't know why it's not advancing. Oh, there, okay. I was using arrows, that wasn't working. So one thing we know is anytime we have more rain, we have more fungal disease because almost all fungal diseases require uh, moisture to cause infections. Same thing with bacteria. Warmer, wetter conditions all favor bacteria. So um, we're going to have a lot more fungal leaf spot diseases, a lot more uh, uh, early blight and septoria leaf spot in our tomatoes. And one thing we've noticed in the last several years, um, last two years actually, we've had a real increase in fire blight, which is a bacterial disease of um, uh, apple, pear, anything in the rose family, you get that. Um, it almost looks like they've been hit by fire. You get these uh, strikes in usually when it's warm and wet in early June, uh, late May. So we've seen a really high incidence of that the past couple of years. One thing, uh, another thing that is happening with climate change is we're getting more rain variation. I really have been noticing this in Vermont, especially since they're um, uh, sharing these drought maps um, uh, every month. And it's, I never, I, you know, I always thought Vermont was pretty, uh, you know, even throughout the state, but boy, there's a lot of stratification in the amount of rainfall. Just last year, um, up in the very northern part of the state, it was really dry. Up in Alberg, I had some research plots up there. We had no disease at all. But lower in the state, the, all the storms were coming right across uh, the lower part of the state. So they had so much more um, disease in those areas. So whenever I get called calls from growers or gardeners, I'd always want to know what part of the state they were in because that really affected the diseases they were seeing. Um, so one thing that we can do, and cattle probably talk more about this, is uh, with this rain variation, we need more irrigation. We need a, a water source. And when I started in my job 40 years ago, most of the vegetable growers, uh, very few had irrigation. And now you cannot grow vegetables without a, a source of irrigation water. Um, it's just a fact of life now. So uh, that's one thing we can do as gardeners. We all always want to use uh, drip irrigation. We don't want to wet the foliage because that you know, leads to more fungal diseases. So use of drip irrigation. The other thing we can do to mitigate some of these drought periods um, is use mulches. Uh, that helps conserve water. You can use straw or plastic. Um, that will uh, help conserve moisture. Also staking tomatoes. That helps when it's really rainy, helps get the foliage off the ground and improve air circulation because anytime you can get that foliage to dry off quickly, you'll have fewer fungal diseases. 
Um, the other thing you can do with your soils is make sure there's good organic matter in your soils, and that's uh, you can improve that by adding compost, cover crops, things like that. Because the higher the organic matter content of your soil, um, the more water holding capacity it will have. So that's uh, usually a good thing. Um, with some of this drought uh, um, conditions that we've had the past couple years, it seems like late summer, it's been really dry. And that led to one fall, we had a pretty big windstorm. And anytime you've got really dry roots and trees, they're much easier blown over. So that's another consequence of drought conditions and, and climate change. We're, with climate change, we're, uh, the plant hardiness zones are changing and the zones are moving north by 30 yards per day. And if you look at the uh, zones in 1990 ver the, versus the zones in 2012, and probably uh, if you look at 2022, you know, around Lake Champlain, we're probably zone five now, but uh, we used to be uh, for me. So all those hardiness zones are uh, moving north, which in some ways it's good. You know, we can grow a lot more red buds and maybe we'll become the okra and artichoke capital of the world someday. But, um, you know, it also means that we lose some of the plants that um, we depend on, like maples. Maples, it just may become too warm to grow maples and to have a sugaring industry in the state. So the other thing with these uh, extreme weather events that we're seeing is that there's that uh, creates um, a pathway to bring in new pathogens and pests or have them show up earlier. So there was a, a I think in 1994, Hurricane uh, Ivan uh, was happening and it blew all this soybean rust, all these spores up into the United States where they had never been in this country before. So it introduced a whole new disease into our country and now it's uh, and growers have to spray for that disease. So it's it now resides here. Um, we also uh, on Hurricane Irene uh, quite a few years ago, that's when we first uh, got spotted wing Drosophila, a really devastating uh, little fruit fly to uh, our small fruit industry. But that blew up on Hurricane Irene. Um, late blight is another disease that uh, it doesn't overwinter in Vermont, as neither does basil downy mildew, but they overwinter in the south. And depending on storms and how the storm fronts work over the course of the season, it may show up earlier in the season uh, than we're, we're used to. Um, also, allium leaf miner is a new uh, uh, pest in alliums. We don't have it in Vermont yet, but it's in the Hudson Valley from New York. So the possibility of any storm coming up from uh, up the East Coast, uh, we have a chance that this allium leaf miner is going to blow into Vermont. It, it's cre creating um, huge losses in uh, New York State with the commercial onion crop. Uh, people might be familiar with Swede midge. This is another invasive pest that showed up uh, a few years ago. Um, and onion leek moth. Uh, Swede midge is a real problem in brassica crops. It feeds on the um, growing point and uh, either it rots all the uh, growing points so you get no crop or else you might get multiple broccoli heads or multiple cabbages. It only attacks brassicas. But that's been a huge issue um, the past several years in Vermont. And onion leek moth, another one that uh, came in from another state, probably on a storm front. Plus, we're moving things around all the time. But uh, a lot of opportunity for storms to blow in some of these uh, really bad pests and diseases. I don't know why sometimes my uh, screen advances and sometimes it doesn't. It's not advancing. Um, hmm. 
email. You, Anne, do you want to go ahead and just email me yours and I'll put them up on my, oh, there you go. Um, yeah, I don't know why it would stop. Um, sometimes I'm going to try resharing. Okay. Hmm. I've never had that happen before. Uh, okay, let me try something else. Well, uh, okay. Um, there's another arrow on the screen that you can also advance it with. Um, so we've had the, some of the hottest summers on record the past few summers. I think every summer is hotter than the last. And so one thing that we see from that, we're having longer seasons. The day has a pro. Maybe we can uh, get another uh, succession crop in there um, and get bigger crops because we have longer season seasons, but it also means more opportunities for disease, more insect life cycles, more disease life cycles. So um, anytime you have more disease in insects, it also means more pesticides uh, for our commercial growers and more crop loss and more money wasted. Um, also these warmer temperatures uh, may affect the overwintering insects. They may overwinter better. Uh, and the same with diseases. So um, that sort of remains to be seen what's going to happen with these warmer temperatures. One thing that we have noticed the past couple s summers is there's a lot of vegetable problems that are related to high temperature injury. One is the picture on the left, which is uh, blossom end rot in tomatoes. That's caused, it's an abiotic disease, it's non-infectious, but it's caused by water fluctuation and calcium movement in the plant, typically with the first tomatoes produced, and then as the season goes on, the plant figures it out. But when we have uh, moisture fluctuation early in the season, uh, that can become a real problem. So using mulches, uh, even watering, that all helps with uh, the blossom end rot. Plus, I've noticed some varieties, some cultivars are more susceptible to this than others. So keeping track of that might help. Um, another thing with the hot temperatures, um, we in zucchini and squash plants, we get more male blossoms um, with hot temperatures. So no fruit are being produced when we only have male blossoms. Also, it's, uh, bees don't like to work when it's really hot and the pollen gets sticky. So we have poor pollination. So we get those weird looking um, cucumbers and squash, they've had incomplete pollination. The other thing we notice that when uh, temperatures are over 90 degrees in the day, and especially with warm nighttime temperatures, uh, we get a lot of blossom drop in uh, tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. And it's something we've seen a lot in high tunnels, but I think we're also seeing it in our gardens. So if you're noticing that you're having a sort of a skip in tomato production, uh, try to think back um, about the weather and it may be from those really uh, earlier high temperatures. Okay, so what can we do about all these uh, problems? Um, rotations are more important than ever because all these plant diseases uh, overwinter on the uh, tissue from the year before. So cleaning that up will minimize what overwinters. So crop rotation is really important. And a lot of you are in community gardens. Um, it's kind of hard in community gardens, but it's still helpful because there are uh, soil pathogens too, that it's really good to uh, move your plants around because the tomato root rot pathogens will build up if you leave your tomatoes in the same place year after year. So it's still important to move things around even if you have a small space. Um, start with clean seed and clean transplants. Make sure you're putting out really good, healthy stuff uh, in the garden. Um, use really, use good plant spacing. If you've got the land and the space, 
uh, the farther you put things apart, the quicker they'll dry off. So you don't want to overcrowd things. Also weeding is really important because that improves air circulation around your plants. It'll minimize some of those fungal uh, diseases. Um, that also, uh, the good plant spacing also uh, pertains to pruning, either whether you're pruning tomatoes, uh, removing the suckers, that improves air circulation, or in the case of um, our crab apples and apples, we've had a lot of late season fungal diseases, apple scab, and there's another new fungal leaf spot. Uh, the thing I tell home gardeners right now they should be doing is going out, raking up any fallen leaves so that um, there's no overwintering inoculum probably should have done that last fall, but going out and pruning now. So you open up that apple or crab apple tree, open it up to air and light because um, the more light than, that can penetrate those limbs, the less fungal disease you'll have. Also just keeping up the vigor of your plants, you know, making sure that you've got good soil fertility and if you need to side dress because plants are sort of like us, if we get run down, they're gonna be more stressed by diseases or pests. So just make sure you know what the crop needs are for your plant and, and meet those. Um, you can orient your rows if you've got land. Uh, take advantage of the prevailing winds so that moves down your row and aerates things. Um, good soil management. Also, uh, you know, improving organic matter, fertility using resistant varieties, kind of keeping track of what disease problems you had the previous year. And when you're purchasing seed, look for resistance. I mean, we have really good resistance to uh, late blight and some of the leaf spot diseases in tomato, um, cucumber, uh, scab. There are a lot of things that um, we have resistance for. So take advantage of those tools. Same thing if you're planting a new apple tree or crab apple, look for a, an apple scab resistant cultivar and only plant those that are gonna have minimum diseases. Um, the other thing that I think is becoming more and more important is uh, the use of plastics. It's like in the graduate, you know, uh, when he pulled Dustin Hoffman aside and say, uh, said, go into plastics. Um, maybe a lot of you aren't old enough to know that movie. But anyway, I think, uh, you know, a lot of our growers have moved to high tunnels. Uh, we don't have that many field grown commercial tomatoes anymore because once they're moved inside a high tunnel, you've eliminated all that rainfall. And so you've eliminated uh, two of the major diseases in tomatoes. So just by using a high tunnel that uh, keeps uh, the plant leaves drier. A high tunnel using drip. You also, uh, there are some diseases that uh, infect with high humidity. So with these high tunnels, you may, you need to be able to open up the sides, open up the ends, uh, ventilate them from the top. So that's really important. And then uh, this um, protected agriculture is really important with a lot of these insect pests. We have seen more and more insect pressure in the past several years. And I know growers have told me that it's totally different from when they used to farm 30 years from 30 years ago, just much more pest pressure. But I think a big uh, help is are some of these row covers. And that's been the, um, a great, uh, way to manage this spotted wing drosophila. And we're lucky as home gardeners, we don't grow, we're not growing acres of raspberries or blueberries. So we typically can use PVC pipe uh, hoops and buy ProTech 80, which is a special netting, a very small netting, cover our small fruits and totally exclude the spotted wing drosophila. You have to seal the edges and only go in when you pick, but that's a great way to, um, uh, not have to use any pesticides for that pest and still come up with a uh, grow a clean crop. Same thing with um, you know onion leek moth and uh, squash vine borer. Using row covers are is a really great tool for a lot of these insect pests and it's really important to um, 
uh, to know the life cycle of the pest you're dealing with. And so one thing you can do, uh, I work with the master gardeners and uh, we used to take in uh, plant samples, but we haven't been doing that because of COVID in the past couple of years. But we have a website, if you go to the master gardener website, there's a new platform we're using called Ask Extension. So uh, you can ask any sort of gardening or pest question in that um, portal, that platform. You can upload pictures and a master gardener will answer your question or if it's a disease or pest one, I'll probably look at it and we can get you an answer. So with any of these problems, it's really important to get a positive ID. So then you can learn the life cycle of the pest or the disease and try to um, intervene when you can. So I think that's my, yeah, that's my spiel on diseases and pests in climate change. I mean, I could go through every disease and pest, and <laughs> but there's just so many and people would fall asleep, so. Thank you, Anne. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Oh. Yep. Okay. Um, I, I want to start off by saying that I myself have used that service that Anne just talked about where you can ask your question and plug in your pictures and the responses are accurate and really quick. It's totally amazing. Um, Anne has been an incredible help to so many farmers over the years and growers throughout the state. And I'm not quite sure, Anne, how you find the time to, to do all that um, and uh, carry such a wealth of knowledge with you. So thank you for all of your work. Um, as Anne mentioned, um, you know, soil health is a really big way is an opportunity for us to manage water, to manage nutrients, and to manage pests. Um, so these are the soil health principles that you see on the screen. These are designed by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. The first four are from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, which is a branch of the USDA. Uh, uh, the fifth is actually coined by a guy named Gabe Brown who's one of my personal heroes, a rancher from North Dakota. He wrote a great book, Google it. He's awesome and he narrates it. Um, and number six really just makes sense. So if you follow one through five, you're getting to number six. And I just wanna go through these sort of briefly. Um, while these are simple, they can feel overwhelming to the homeowner or the gardener or the farmer. Um, but one thing I like to really encourage folks to do is, first of all, recognize how are you meeting these principles currently and what can you do to me move the needle just a little bit more in the direction of employing these principles. The first one, living roots in the ground, is really talking about green growing plants with living roots in the ground 365 days a year. In our climate, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're photosynthesizing, although we do have a large variety of conifers here that are photosynthesizing throughout the winter. And those living roots with the green growing plants are conducting photosynthesis, which is the driver of our water systems and our nutrient cycles. Um, so really maximizing those living roots in the ground whenever possible, wherever possible is really important. Among those living roots, we want to maximize the diversity of species, of timing of plants, of timing of blossoms, of heights and depths of root systems, heights of plants, girth, every kind of measure of diversity that you can think of is good. Um, by doing so, you will also be attracting the maximum diversity of insects, both, unfortunately, the pests that Anne talked about with our weather conditions changing, but you'll also get the maximum beneficials, which will help to manage some of those pests. And I hope that folks can ask some questions about beneficials. Um, I, I can answer some and I'll bet Anne can answer a bunch as well. Um, minimizing disturbance, the third principle is really thinking about disturbance as, um, I mean, it's everything from flooding to tilling to pesticides 
uh, to sticking the broad fork in the ground. Um, it's hard to garden without any disturbance. And I think, again, it's about moving that needle. Where are we at? Uh, do we till our garden every single year? Or do we need to do that? Um, can we disturb the soil less and still produce food? Because every time we disturb the soil, especially in depth, we're actually disturbing the entire microbiome of organisms in the soil. All the root systems, all the mycorrhizal zones where the organisms live, and those organisms are bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, worms, fungus, et cetera. They're all incredibly helpful to us. Um, and yes, there are also pathogenic organisms in that mix, and it's all part of the balance. So minimizing disturbance will maximize the amount of organisms living in that ecosystem. We can't change flooding. We can't change the amount of rain coming in, but we can try to change the conditions where that raindrop meets the soil. And one way to do that is to not have bare soil. Um, I, I wanna start out by saying that there are some places in nature where bare soil happens and we shouldn't change that. There are some places in our lawns, even if you wanna have a lawn, where um, certain insects really require that bare soil in order to um, reproduce, um, scree piles in the woods, et cetera. But for the most part, we wanna have those living roots in the ground and not have bare soil. And that includes the time right after you till until the, your seeds are planted. Um, so when we can minimize the amount of time that soil is bare and minimize the amount of square foot uh, that soil is bare, we're actually helping all of the ecosystem to prosper and thrive. Animals in contact with the soil, you can think of animals as everything from microbes to elephants. <laughs> um, it, it, you don't have to be a farmer managing livestock to have animals in contact with your soil, but if you're creating a maximized biodiverse ecosystem, it's guaranteed that you're gonna have lots and lots of organisms the winged ones and the, the slithery ones and the scaled ones and uh, the feathered ones uh, will be there. And they're all a part of that ecosystem and that's important. And likewise, if you are raising livestock, integrating that livestock into the ecosystem in a way where the animals can be in contact with soil and not create disturbance is also ideal. When you're following all of these principles, you're helping to create that sponge-like consistency of soil, which absorbs and infiltrates water, can hold it through drought times. So the soil health principles are really key. Um, and again, don't get too hung up, but think about how can you improve what you're doing already on no matter what scale you're at. And that can include everything from raised beds on a rooftop in a city to a 10,000 acre farm. You wanna feed the soil and we do that with the sun. And while we're doing that, we sequester carbon. The, um, the rhizosphere is the place around roots. Every sing individual single root hair has a space around it, this microscopic space called the rhizosphere. I like to talk about that as the magic space. There's a lot of science and detail happening in that space. It's important to know that those roots and the way that they interact with the soil and the goose, glues, snots, and slimes and situ that's all around those roots is actually the sort of conveyor belt for nutrients and organisms. So having those living healthy roots in the ground is really important. And I just love that picture on the right. That's not in our region. <laughs> that's in the grasslands. Um, but that's how, you know, deep roots can be really deep. Um, and those plants, uh, so looking at this picture here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that brown thing in the middle is a tiny, tiny root hair. All around that tiny root hair in the blue area is what's called the rhizosphere. And in that rhizosphere, you can see a lot of action. The white lines coming in from the right and the left are indicating mycorrhizal fungi uh, and fungal hyphae which are helping to conduct nutrients and also all sorts of communication systems among plants. Uh, and the little red zone, the red things are indicating biology in the soil. 
those root hairs absorb water and nutrients from the soil. And it's important to note that when we're thinking about healthy soil and creating that sponge, um, first, well, let me rephrase that. We're not creating the sponge. Nature is creating the sponge and we're creating the conditions for nature to do the magic work that she does. Inside of the soil, there's actually a lot more air than you think about. And Anne was talking about organic matter and how important it is to have a higher organic matter content in your soil. One way to do that is through adding compost. Another is through adding mulch. Um, another is to observe nature and watch how she does it and learn to integrate those systems into your garden. Bringing in those pore spaces into soil is allowing for water and air to exchange through the soil and having air exchange through the soil is creating an aerobic environment for your plants, which is really important. I'm gonna end on this slide and then hope to get a lot of questions. Um, I do have more pictures if we need to refer to them, um, but this slide really kind of does it for me um, in terms of roots. I like to point out that uh, roots can be as deep as the bedrock will allow it to be. Um, this slide is actually taken for, uh, it, this is a southwestern prairie plant slide, um, but you can, the gardeners in the room, so to speak, will recognize plants like lupin and echinacea and, and different mustard varieties that we also have in our northeast region. And you can see how deep those roots get. Note that one place where it says 15 feet. And then that circle on the top left is indicating your standard lawn. So when you think about the potential of root systems, those living roots in the ground, to increase the carbon storage in soil, to increase the water holding capacity and the air storage in soil, to create that soil sponge, to conduct nutrient exchange through photosynthesis, we want to have more and more and more root system. One indicator for the gardeners in the room, one way to know if your roots are healthy is when you pull those roots out of the ground, don't yank them first of all, but when you gently lift those roots out of the ground, if your roots are dirty, like really dirty, that's an indicator that you have a lot of biological activity in your soil and you're on your way to creating healthy conditions for thriving ecosystems. If those roots are clean, you've got some work to do. So I'm gonna leave it there stop sharing and uh, open to questions. Thank you both so much. Michelle, you're gonna chime in? I am gonna chime in. We have a few questions in the chat. I know we have some that were already sent in earlier, but let's maybe cover some of these first. Um, and one from Sylvia says, early blight was disastrous on tomatoes last year. I've since learned about two different remedies to deal with this. One is based on hydrogen peroxide followed by baking soda. The other is a biodynamic remedy that is made from horsetail. Are, are you familiar, and this was when Anne was speaking, are you familiar with either of these? Yeah, um, the baking soda, that works so well for some diseases that it's been taken over by a pesticide company and it's sold as Armacarb. So uh, baking soda sprays um, really are great for controlling powdery mildews. I don't know what their efficacy is on the tomato leaf spot diseases. I've never heard that they, it has much activity against that. Um, and the oxidate, a lot of growers use oxidate. The only problem with oxidate, it will kill any spore that is on the leaf when you spray it. The problem is, is that if another spore drops on that leaf, 10 hours later, you know, there's no residual activity. So you'd have to spray it very often to really control disease. But I know a lot of growers that um, go in and spray oxidate and then follow it with something else, another biological. So, uh, you know, I haven't tested the, those two together. So if you think it, uh, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence out there. If you think that improves or, or minimizes the leaf spot, um, keep it up. The problem is, is you know, we, we don't know because we never do controls <laughs> as gardeners. We never um, keep a couple tomatoes that were not 
spraying that stuff on uh, to make sure that it really there really is a significant difference in diseases. But yeah, they both have fungicidal action. I just have not, uh, yeah, I haven't heard of the baking soda on the tomato leaf spot diseases. But that's the one if you, you know, use a straw mulch, steak, uh, prune off the lower leaves, prune suckers, keep up the uh, fertility of the plant. And then depending on the rainfall, if we have a drier summer, um, we can get away with not having a lot of that disease. Thank you. Another question um, talks kind of about kind of gathering this information and the lessons that we're learning. Um, is there is there an area within um, extension that some of these uh, impacts are being kind of gathered and, and stored? Is there any way that um, that average, you know, that, that gardeners that aren't connected necessarily to extension, is there a website or any place that people can go and look on um, and, and see some of, you know, kind of understand what's being learned um, and solutions for them? Uh, there is no like overarching website that would have all that kind of information. One of the problems with some of this, uh, a lot of the organic research is that uh, a lot of us um, do our research based on the grants that we get and it's hard to get grants to do some of this basic organic research. But, um, you know, I would suggest, uh, you know, Googling different, uh, you know, different problems and always going to university websites. Uh, that's a great way to learn information. Um, using that Master Gardener Ask extension, that, that's a good way to um, find out more information. But there is no one site and things are always changing you know we're learning new things every year um so yeah it'd be great if there was one site i would be on that site all the time <laughs> learning things well, maybe i think that's... i also saw a picture i mean a, a chat somebody had asked about using um horsetail as a um pesticide and uh for one of my research projects i did uh, i compared um there's a, an organic spray uh, for apple trees that includes uh, horsetail, stinging nettle, essential microbes, neem. Um, and then I compared it with traditional organic, which is copper and sulfur, to see if there was um, any effect. And the horsetail was supposed to add silica. And there are papers that say silica does have either a plant triggering um, uh, effect or it can uh, help with some plant diseases. In my research, I found that it, it didn't control it as well as the traditional um, organic using copper and sulfur. But um, yeah, it provides silica, which is, um, is used as a bio uh, pesticide or elicitor. Thank you. Um, another I'd question. Like just, can I can I add? Oh sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, folks that are interested in that, and Sylvia, thank you for the question. Um, I think we have a lot to learn about the the natural. I hate to use the word pesticide, but you're right, Anne. That is the function, isn't it? Um, I want to promote. Um, Mycorrhizal Planet, which is a book written by Michael Phillips and his wife, Nancy Phillips. Unfortunately, Michael uh, just passed away in the orchard. Uh, and so buying his book could actually really be helpful to the family. But uh, he and Nancy have done a lot of work um, at Lost Nation Orchard, the only organic apple orchard in the Northeast, and have been very generous in sharing their knowledge. So I highly recommend that book and learning from the work of Michael and Nancy Phillips. And I also just want to mention Korean natural farming um, is something that a lot of us are learning more about. It's an ancient technology of learning about fermentation and using those as sprays. It's not unlike compost tea, um, but it's also using different plants and herbs. So it's a nice combination of of herbal medicine uh, for people and for, for plants. Um, we have a lot to learn there, so I definitely want to encourage that. 
And I think there is a lot of research going on. I think people are really excited about some of these bio um, pesticides, I guess I will call them. But um, one of the things, you know, when a spore lands on a, a leaf, there's all this signaling that goes on between the, the pathogen and the plant. Like if the plant, the plant recognizes that spore as a um, threat, and it will increase its plant defenses through this whole signaling throughout its plant. So I think the goal and one exciting thing is to, we're hoping that we can learn more about that signaling that goes on and then maybe that's where we can intervene instead of using some conventional fungicide or insecticide. Maybe we can figure out how to trigger these um, their plant elicitors basically trigger this uh, defense system. So uh, there's a lot of work going on. There's a lot more happening in Europe than there is in the United States. I've been to big conferences on this. So it's kind of encouraging that this is happening. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Lindy. Can you please address clay soil, its benefits, drawbacks, treatments other than adding compost, manure, and mulch, and other thoughts about working with clay soil and how to cultivate it after winter rye, winter rye cover crop? I can try to start. Um, clay soil is, you know, in some ways it's a gift because you have an incredible amount of mineral nutrients available in that soil. Uh, but what you don't have is a lot of air space in that soil. So yes, adding organic matter as you're doing, um, it's a slow process. Um, I know that we have a lot of Vermont Hill farmers that have been really good at managing clay soil for a long time. And um, some of them have to wait and get out later in the year because of that spring wetness, because of the lack of air space in the soil. Um, having no personal experience, thankfully, <laughs> with heavy clay soils. I'm not sure that I can give you any tried and true advice, but I'll bet that Anne has something to say. Well, I, yeah, clay soils, they are a gift, but yeah, they're tough. And um, my sister has a, a, her, she gardens in Heinsberg and her soils are all clay. So the way they've mitigated that, you know, you can add uh, organic matter, but they've just ended up building um, raised beds and trying to amend things that way. And, and uh, um, because I don't think they're going to be there long enough to, you know, really raise, you know, change that uh, clay component. So they've gotten around it by using raised beds. Yeah, but more the more organic matter you can put into that soil, the better it is. But then trying to incorporate that organic matter, like Kat was saying, you know, you're disrupting the soil, you're breaking up all those good connections that are happening in the soil. So, you know, with all these things, it's sort of a balance. You have to figure out, uh, you know, the whole balance because some things will hurt one system and improve another system. So it's a balancing act. Fred has a couple of questions in the chat, but he also had his hand up. So I don't know if he's gonna prioritize some of these. Fred, do you wanna just unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, um, somebody used a key word I'm looking for, but I'm wondering what, oh, signaling, that the plants signal one another. I, is there any really serious work going on about companion planting? I really got into it last year, but I went on the website and you know what one author lists as compa compatible plants, <laughs> the next one says something different. So it, it has a little bit of magic about it, but I, I'm wondering if we can st strengthen our vegetables somewhat by careful companion planting. I know some of it works, well, yeah, it's, um, those are the hard things. It's a lot of stuff is of this information is anecdotal because there's not the funds that people are doing controlled trials. But I would just suggest as gardeners, you guys become your own researchers. If you want to try a certain companion planting, 
do that with a couple rows or whatever, but then leave a row without that companion planting and just, uh, you know, let us know what the difference is, you know. So I think we could learn a lot by that if we all just have sort of a control plot for some of these things we want to try. Go ahead, Kat. I, you had something. Yeah. No, that's that's great. I would say the same thing. And um, I am just refreshing on the actual question. Companion planting. <laughs> Companion planting. So, yes, a lot of it's anecdotal. Um, there, there is some research showing that, uh, for instance, um, the marigold and tomato thing is really about marigold's uh, signal <laughs> to organisms in the soil, uh, specifically those that would bore on roots um, on tomatoes and signal against them. So uh, solanaceous crops. Uh, as Anne said, there's not enough research to really prove the scientific interactions that are happening there. But I think there are a lot of really reasonable observations we can make. For example, um, we know that all herbs that we grow, almost all of the herbs that we grow have lots and lots of tiny little flowers. And those tiny little flowers attract serpent flies and many other beneficial insects uh, that will help to create biodiversity of insects in our garden and help to manage some of the pest pressure. So I think <laughs> that when you're thinking about functionality of companionship, that is something we can rely on. Um, tomatoes grow well with carrots. Part of that is because the root system of the carrot doesn't interfere with that of the tomato. And the light requirements for both are also easily adjusted. They work well together. Asparagus and strawberries can grow well together for those same reasons, if you can keep the grass out. <laughs> um, you know, so there, there are lots of functional reasons to grow plants together. And I absolutely rely on that. And I listen for those observations. I watch who visits. And if I'm seeing more insects in my garden, even if I don't know who they are, that's a good sign to me. Um, diversity is better. So I hope that's helpful. I think there's another question here, but I also oh, just wanted to make. Go ahead. I was just going to make a comment that maybe, you know, one one outcome of this panel series may be that we can start collecting some of these tests and trials that folks are doing. Um, and, you know, maybe you do leave a, a kind of a donor plant, you know, that, that's not part of your part of your experiment. But if um, but if all of us can try a couple of these things and, and have one place to report back, um, that might be really interesting. And then I'm sorry, Anne, I'm going to go ahead and let you um, interject before I ask the next question that's on the Oh, list. I was just going to say there's a lot of work going on right now about using biofumigants like um, mustard crops, planting mustard crops and then tilling them under and then planting another crop because they found that it does release volatiles and uh, is helpful for suppressing some pathogens. So there is some work out there. You just have to, you know, look through the literature and find it. That's true. And also that makes me think about, you know, you had mentioned before and crop rotations and part of the under, part of my understanding of crop rotations is also about companions in the, in the context of, for instance, we grow beans to um, bring in more nitrogen into the soil. And then we might follow that crop with corn the following year because the corn requires a lot of nitrogen. So, uh, you know, thinking about crops in cycle like that are, is also a kind of companion planting, thinking about the functionality of those plants. Another one, um, many of us are starting to learn more about cover crops and green manures and using um, uh, forage radish or um, deep daikon root to break up hard pan soil. I'm thinking again of the person with clay soil. Um, using plants, jackhammer plants is one thing we call them. Cannabis is actually a jackhammer plant that has a very deep, strong taproot that can bust through some kinds of soil. So thinking about those companion functions as well, not just what's above ground or who they attract, but also what's below ground. <laughs> okay, um, we have another soil question. What is the balance between minimal <laughs> disturbance and loosening the soil for good root growth in beets and carrots um, and things like that? 
Thank you, Kathleen, for that question. It's a great one. Um, and honestly, you know, the one place that I till in my garden, not with a tiller, but with my hands or whatever I need to to get the soil fine enough is where I plant my carrots. Um, carrots are teeny, teeny, tiny seeds, and it's already so hard to get them spaced or to thin them. Um, so again, for me, the soil health principles are about moving that needle. Um, do we have to till every single part of our garden uh, like we do for carrots? Probably not. Another thing is potatoes. A lot of folks have trouble with potatoes and other roots, um, but I would recommend one way to not bore into the soil so much is a shallow till so that the roots can get down and then you mulch on top so that the leaves can go through a mulch. So there are some ways to do it, but I don't, I don't wanna discourage folks from getting into the soil to plant those root crops, but some things can be done with a broad fork that may have been done before with a rototiller. So I think that's the balance for me. I hope that's helpful. Um, and then we did have a couple of comments um, about plastics. And I know, you know, from, from being a, a network of community gardens, there are um, garden leaders and garden organizers that, that may um, discourage the use of plastics. And so um, we're, I, I, that might be some, that might just be a change of tide that we're, that we're gonna have to address um, and I don't know if anybody has comment on that or it was just, just something that I noticed. Yeah, I think that's a huge problem in Vermont. They're still trying to figure out how to deal with all this ag plastic. And yeah, if we can not use it, that's the best use, you know, straw, hay, newspaper, cardboard, whatever. Something that is going to add something back to the soil rather than plastic adds nothing. True. Um, I try to use as little plastic as I can, but I do have it, uh, and so I use it. And, and some of the ways I do that are um, on a very small scale using cut off milk jugs as mini greenhouses around my brassica plants when I put them out really early. And then I lift those off, you know, certainly trying to reuse plastic. Um, remay cloth is something I really like, those white floating row covers. They're super helpful for managing cucumber beetles. Um, early on in the season uh, for flea beetles on brassicas, adding a couple degrees of warmth uh, and they are reusable. Um, it can be tricky to seal them off the way that farms do if you're not tilling your soil, but um, along the edge so that pests aren't getting underneath. Um, I do think that as we move forward um, in this world of climate change, we need to be a lot smarter about the petroleum that we use. Um, I do think that if we can manage it, using it for things like extending growing seasons and greenhouses is one way to do it. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what the best way forward with that is. Reducing our dependency is important, um, but as Anne very rightly pointed out, we have very few in-field tomato growers at this point because it's so much easier to manage the plethora of diseases that come and infect our tomatoes by being able to manage completely the water that they're exposed to. A suggestion from Jean about degradable plastics. And I know they're working on that, but I've heard from growers that they, they kind of disintegrate and make a mess in a lot of cases. That's what I've heard too. Yeah. Um, and as a composter, I have really deep concerns about things that we call biodegradable but actually leave bits of micro particles right. that we don't quite understand um I, so I, yeah i'm not a big fan of the biodegradable plastics at all I, I think it's a it's a bad way forward either keep it solid and reusable or cut it out <laughs> it's my opinion um a note from gene just saying they're they're experimenting with moving from plastic to deep hay mulch so that might be an option. Yeah. Great. And one thing I do want to say about mulches, I'm a big fan. I use them all the time. Uh, and those of you who also use them know that you also have some new pests. So slugs, if you're in the rainy section of Vermont, right? And, you know, if, if you were in Southern Vermont last year, you had a lot of slugs if you were using mulch. Uh, you also end up with voles and moles and rodents, you know, really trying to dig in and take advantage of the beautiful home that you're providing for them. 
<laughs> so uh, every action comes with other reactions. <laughs> Fred, Fred, did you have something to add or another question or was that your hand up from before? Okay, maybe that was from before. Um, no, I guess it was from, I don't know why I have two screens. <laughs> I don't, I wasn't sure either, but maybe you just have lots of yeah, I tried to put. I tried to put my hand down on the other screen and it's not working, so. Okay. Um, well, we do have some other scripted questions that were sent in um, prior to us getting on here, and Hannah has a few of those. So was there anything, Hannah, that seemed like it hadn't gotten covered yet? Um, I see a question from Fred here. Um, thank you, Fred, for you, you put in a lot of great questions here. I'm trying to sort through them. Um, I see that you had one. I've gardened at the interview for a decade, just now working compost into the understory about eight inches down. Absolutely nothing but alluvial sand down there. So I'm assuming organic material on its own won't go down more than eight to 12 inches. Is there any benefit to start working that soil a foot down or just putting organic on the surface? Um, so my initial response to that is keep working from the surface. We build soil up but roots can build soil down. So perhaps you wanna think about incorporating some cover crops or even crops that can grow for a year or two that have really nice deep root systems, maybe some clovers uh, and some grasses, maybe a multi-species mix, which is another thing we need a lot more research on. But as we're learning about the way that plants signal, um, and we're learning about the microbiome of plants and the potential of all these organisms. We are learning that a diversity of plants attracts a different set of organisms and then recreates this whole interaction of like a sweet spot. <laughs> So that's a, a really simple description of some of the work of uh, Dr. James White, um, um, uh, uh, Chris Nichols, um, Christine Jones, Dr. Christine Jones from New Zealand. Um, look up the uh, quorum sensing, really interesting stuff there. So um, I think part of what we need to do is think less about how do humans control soil more than we need to be thinking about how do we partner with plants and animals to create conditions for thriving deep soil watersheds. Thanks. Um, another question is just come in, threaded leaves as mulch and for sheet mulching. I also have jumping snake worms on my property. So is this something I should no longer do? Um, it's probably not uh, bringing in more worms, but they do feed on the top layer of leaf litter. So you might be providing them with lots of great food. Um, so yeah, you may wanna uh, hold off on that, especially if you know where the uh, jumping worms are. These are so bad. Um, they're really a problem all over the country. I think they're going to find that it's probably everywhere. But uh, we have a researcher working on trying to uh, come up with a control for these. A grad student is working with him. And they're finding some promising things, some good organic uh, management options with this jumping worm, but there's nothing labeled yet to use. But one thing he was suggesting that gardeners do, if you buy any compost or mulch or bagged compost and mulch, uh, make sure you solarize it before you put it out in your garden so you're not introducing new worms into the garden. Also, if you're buying potted plants, pull them out, take a look, see if there are any uh, worms in there. The problem is, is that uh, their cocoons, their little eggs are dark brown and they're two millimeters big. So we can't, we can't see those. But, um, but if you do solarize, you know, spread out the mulch in a, you know, a layer that's like six inches deep, 
put plastic under it and then plastic over it, seal it and let it uh, heat up in the sun for a few days, that will kill um, both the cocoons and the adults. So that's a really good thing to, you know, avoid bringing it into your, onto your land and into your garden. Yeah, so far we don't have anything to cure once your place is already infested with these. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that. It's, it's, a, it's a really unfortunate thing. And thank you, Marilyn, for bringing it up in a discussion about climate change. We really ought to be talking about these worms. They've been here for a long time, but over the last five or 10 years, they've really jumped <laughs> significantly. Um, we have Dr. Joseph Goreff from U UVM doing most of the research on that. Um, and Marilyn, I know you're a part of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, but for others that aren't on uh, and are on the call, anyone can join us. We have a listserv. Um, it's all free. It's the UVM listserv. And there are conversations happening about the worms. And I know one woman in Southern Vermont, Olga, who has taken it upon herself to become a expert. Uh, and she's connected with people outside of the country for research as well. So ask your questions. There's no, there are no bad questions. We're here to help. Um, and I also just want to say, I love Michelle, the idea of um, Vermont Garden Network becoming a, a clearinghouse and a gathering spot for information. And maybe the master gardeners would work too um, with that. We could Vermont Healthy Soils could feed stuff in or send people there, but we don't have the capacity to, uh, to manage that. Um, snake worms are a problem. Uh, they also can't, compost really does not help because as Ann said, those worm eggs, the cocoons are so small, we can't be sure that it's gonna reach every portion of the pile. Um, one last thing I'll say, and it's not on a great note, but uh, yes, solarization is the recommended method. And I worry because we're killing everything when we do that. Right, I think that, uh, well, it's another one, you know, you do one thing and it causes another thing, but I think it's better to probably kill these worms in the cocoons because the soil should get recolonized pretty quickly with, with good yeah. guys again. But uh, yeah, stand by because Joseph, he's working hard on some of these organic management. They found that salt uh, can help, but that also is not good for plants and um, right. And yeah. anecdotally, uh, chickens don't eat them. Uh, the worms accumulate heavy metals, maybe, which make them not so tasty. Oh, really? Uh, oh, I so, oh. yeah, um, I have heard also anecdotally from uh, Facebook groups and things that people are really into these worms or against them, We're trying to learn about them that salamanders do eat them. So how do we attract salamanders? But then, you know, <laughs> there's that whole... I don't know if you've ever seen the Looney Tunes where we start with a mouse and we end with an elephant and then we're back to a mouse again, but we gotta be careful of <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, um, I, and I just see that oh. Marilyn had a follow-up question of when should it be solarized? And I would say, Marilyn, uh, now is a great time. The sun is hot. Um, basically, as soon as you get it, uh, you wanna deal with it. And I, I do wanna just uh, say to anyone who didn't pick up on this already in the conversation, please be extremely careful about importing mulches to your land if you do not already have snake worms. Anna? Um, sure, there was one more follow up on that question about the heavy metals Marilyn mentioned. So if they're accumulating heavy metals, maybe that's why they're here. So. I think that's a great question and I'm curious too, but I don't have the answer. You need to was... just eat the PFOA that's in all everything in the microplastics. That would be good. Right. <laughs> good idea, Ian. <laughs> but then what do we do with them? Then they'll just release it though when they die. So forget that idea. Right. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure. Is there another question? Cause I, I did just wanna, we talked a bit about companion planting but we didn't talk much about mycorrhiza. We talked about plants as companions but I just wanna plant the seed <laughs> for folks to really think about um, incorporating 
fungus and mushrooms intentionally into your landscape and being aware of the volunteers that show up in your landscape, whether pathogenic or beneficial, get to know these guys because our scientific community is beginning to see the incredible potential uh, in understanding of all soil ecosystems through understanding the role of fungi in our ecosystems. We're, we're sort of just barely scratching the surface. It's super exciting. Um, and so be thinking about not just plants in your companioning, uh, but think about mushrooms and insects as well. I was gonna ask a question on, um, I help manage a community garden and we write you know, participant agreements and try to work collectively to avoid some of these um, pest issues. And I'm wondering, is there anything that we can put in the agreements or adopt as a group that could help um, maybe just priorities or uh, Kat, you mentioned like moving that needle towards better um, soil health. And I'm wondering what, what those priorities might be for a, for a group of gardeners that might be either newer to gardening or, you know, working together in a shared space. Do you guys do um, soil testing? Not individual, but you have a whole soil test. And mm -hmm. they, do you? Um, so you do know your organic matter levels. I mean, that could be an agreement is that you strive to increase your organic matter uh, levels. You might, uh, people should strive to rotate. Um, you know, I would uh, add something about the jumping worms, you know, that all plants will be uh, examined and you'd rather have bare root plants come into the garden, not necessarily potted plants, transplants. Uh, any mulch that's used is solarized. That's just some of the things I can think of. Those are all great suggestions. I'm always thinking about the brand new gardener at community gardens. It's often the sort of introductory space and, and how important it is to provide that opportunity for someone to connect and, and garden for their first time in a supportive place. Um, so with that in mind and not wanting to create a situation where someone feels uncomfortable or that they're doing something wrong, because I do think it's really important to engage with nature, you know, in a small garden space on the big scale of things, it's more important to me that someone engages with nature and growing food than uh, disturbing the garden a little bit, disturbing the soil. So we're weighing. Um, I agree with all of Anne's suggestions. And I might also, um, I might also consider, you know, some incentive to keep soil covered. Uh, the less bare soil, the better overall in the garden. Um, I might also encourage the community whenever possible to try and grow the pest ridden crops collectively, like potatoes or broccoli. You know, so often every single plot has kale. Um, and then, you know, one person gets the cabbage worm and then everybody's got them or something like that. So just, you know, potatoes, I think, would be the first one though, because potato bugs can just be, they can just ruin someone's whole summer. <laughs> That's great, thank you so much. There was another question on the list that I had um, that's been, I think I think both of you addressed it, but uh, this one, how can we prepare for the unpredictability of the weather? Lots of rain at times, then long periods of drought, high humidity, strong winds, hot sun. Our rainwater catchment, which used to capture sufficient quantities, is now sometimes overflowing and just as often collecting nothing for weeks. Um, I could start off with um, water catchment areas should probably start incorporating swales, which is just a ditch to manage the overflow so that it's not going into your garden, but into a place you'd rather have it go. 
um, if we can be really advanced about that thinking, how do we manage that extra water and slow and sink it and store it to get us through the next drought period? So maybe that's like little ponds or another storage tank to overflow into. Um, and in times of drought, um, we've already addressed a bit, um, you know, Anne talked about the different kinds of structures uh, with, with poly or, or reme also actually help to provide shade and can control some amount of um, evaporation. Uh, you can collect and have back down on a greenhouse, um, but mulches in general, keeping that soil covered so that the baking hot sun isn't stealing all the moisture from it. Um, I think there are lots of other innovative ways to catch water um, but also be thinking about the action reaction. Now you're catching water. Are you also creating an opportunity to breed mis et cetera, et cetera, slugs? Um, so think it through a little bit. Yeah, we had to add another uh, 55 gallon drum for our water catchment um, because we needed overflow. But yeah, when it's, when it's dry for a month, it, um, you go through that water really fast. We had to dig our well deeper last year. So um, yeah, it's a problem. But yeah, all those things I mentioned, the drip incre increasing organic matter using mulches, all those things can help to mitigate some of those. Yeah, I don't know about the winds too. Um, that's another one. Uh, you know, if you've got, uh, if you can plant a hedgerow uh, to break some of those prevailing winds. Um, yeah, it's crazy out there. That's a really great idea, uh, thinking about managing wind for the whole community garden. It's a great idea. Hedgerows, more agroforestry in general, but also mm -hmm. just trying to make sure that you're not robbing your sunlight. Uh, more perennials, deep-rooted perennials in the gardens, pathways, in clover rather than hay, so that you've got deep roots reaching into the ground, storing that moisture, so more living plants. You know, thinking about how can those soil health principles be incorporated even just a little more into the garden. Hey, well, we're actually on time, which is shocking to me. Um, we have uh, just a, a few more minutes and I don't want to keep, I want to be respectful, especially of our presenters who've given up um, an hour and a half of their time tonight. If there's any um, more questions, oh, here we go. What kind of clover is recommended for pathways? I recommend Dutch white clover because it grows low and uh, you can walk all over it. It's really hardy. Um, you really don't need to mow it, but you also can, it flowers in all stages, um, but it does take a little while to establish. Um, it likes soil contact. So when I sow Dutch white clover, which you can usually just buy at the general store, the hardware store, feed store, um, I sprinkle it on the ground pretty heavy. I walk on it. Um, you could be fancy and use a bed roller, <laughs> um, but you basically want that seed to contact the surface, but not be buried and then stay moist. And you may need to weed out for you know the first few months to let the clover really establish itself. It'll never be 100% clover, but remember we want diversity anyway. So. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. This um, session has been recorded. We will make these sessions, all three of them available on our website. Um, uh, after the conclusion of next week's session. And if you haven't already, please join us for next week. Um, we're gonna be talking about broader uh, climate change throughout the state and um, and strategies for how we kind of move forward. And I think, you know, again, sort of creating some sort of uh, collection point for for things folks are trying. And um, even with pictures and things like that, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna think about that. That might be something that we can incorporate into our website. I think it would be, fun to see um and 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 that is you know one one big strategy is just sharing what works and and um and what ha and, and strategies that folks are finding and in different parts of the state because we know we're all all over the place and and 
things can be very different from uh, Newport to Bennington. So, mm -hmm. and everywhere in between. Um, thank you all again. If, um, if you have other questions that come up um, after, you know, three o'clock in the morning when you can't sleep and you knew you wanted to ask something, email me um, and I will get it to the appropriate folks and get you an answer on that. But not at three in the morning, right? Yeah. I won't email you at three in the morning, <laughs> but I often think of things at three in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, all everybody. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Hope you good have night. a good night.